Today we will be talking about chronic diarrhea in pediatric practice. Chronic diarrhea by definition is the passage of loose stools for more than two weeks. Now as far as loose stools are concerned, these are stools which take the shape of the pan in which they go. So remember that loose stools are basically stools which would take the shape of the pan in which they go. So it would not be be formed, it would be more of a liquid consistency because it would be taking the shape of the container in which they go. So if a child is passing uh, these loose stools for more than two weeks, then we call it as chronic diarrhea. So before we talk about how to approach a case, who so is a case of chronic diarrhea, you should know what are the causes of chronic diarrhea. Now it's easy if we split the causes of chronic diarrhea into the following four groups. Number one, cause of chronic diarrhea in the neonatal period. So it means that kids who are born and they have got a complaint of loose stools, what are the possible reasons in that particular case? Then we divide into another group that is the cause of chronic diarrhea in infancy. Then the third group is the chronic diarrhea in school age group. So that would include the uh, preschoolers as well as the schoolers. And the fourth group is of the adolescents that would probably mean those kids who are 12, 13 years onward and they are up to 17 and 18 years of age. So let's talk about uh, the cause of diarrhea in these uh, four groups. So first of all, we'll start with the neonatal group. In neonatal group, remember, the one of the most common causes of chronic diarrhea, if you get, let's say, a child who is three or four weeks of age and he's brought uh, by his parents and they are concerned that he is passing loose stools and the duration is for more than two weeks, then the most common cause in uh, these cases, neonatal age, is what we call as a cow milk protein allergy or milk protein allergy. So milk protein allergy basically is an allergic disorder in which the milk proteins against them, the antibodies are formed and that antibody antigen reaction leads to diarrhea. It leads to uh, damage to the gut epithelium and that in turn leads to diarrhea. And that diarrhea is chronic diarrhea because the diet for a child who's a neonate is obviously milk and as long as he's on milk, he would be having diarrhea. So one of the most common causes is milk protein allergy. Then rarely, Kids who have got some form of incomplete malrotation of the gut, they can also present with, uh, with, with, with chronic diarrhea. Then there are a few other co rare causes like congenital chloride diarrhea or uh, congenital lactose intolerance. These are quite rare and obviously not that much common in practice. Uh, another one uh, reason is neonatal thyroid disease. Now this is also relatively uncommon, but if a child is born with the uh, active thyroid, like overactive thyroid, then one of the presentations could be continuous diarrhea and obviously that diarrhea would be more than two weeks. So sometimes you have to uh, take that into consideration as well. Then in infancy, again, uh, cow milk protein allergy or milk protein allergy as we call them, that can actually extend in the infancy as well because these kids are to some extent, they are on milk so they can have chronic diarrhea. So that would be again the commonest cause of diarrhea in infancy. Then another common cause is toddler diarrhea. So kids who are on weaning diet, sound around seven, eight months of age and onward, they might develop diarrhea. Now that diarrhea is basically uh, because there is uh, not full absorption of uh, some of the components of diet. So they can have like sort of what we call as pea soup diarrhea. So they have got formed and unformed elements in their uh, stools and uh, if the consistency they describe it as a pea soup like where are some formed element and some unformed element some undigested particle you should be thinking of toddler diarrhea and they are otherwise thriving well and they look very well I mean they don't have any weight loss then secondary lactose intolerance this can be secondary to an attack of uh, gastroenteritis now here in UK one of the common causes of uh, gastroenteritis is norovirus uh, Rotavirus is another cause, but because of widespread uh, vaccination available against rotavirus, uh, norovirus is now the number one viral cause of uh, acute gastroenteritis. And sometimes acute gastroenteritis, which itself is a limiting condition, self-limiting condition, sometimes it later on it can persist in the form of uh, what we call a secondary lactose intolerance. So the acute gastroenteritis settles down, but the child who is predominantly on milk, he would be basically not able to digest the milk because these superficial epithelium has been destroyed by the primary gastroenteritis and for some time 
till that epithelium regenerates the child would be having diarrhea especially on milk so that we call as a secondary lactose intolerance and rarely a child who's got cystic fibrosis you know cystic fibrosis is a multi-system disorder in which there are thick secretions and uh, again there's pancreatic insufficiency so these childs uh, they have got uh, the complaint of chronic diarrhea and obviously they are stunted uh, and they have got poor growth despite having a very good appetite and they are suffering from diarrhea like persistent diarrhea then in school age group one of the common causes of diarrhea is constipation now this seems counterintuitive because when we say constipation that present means passage of hard stools or less passage of stools and what it has to do with diarrhea because these are two opposite terms but nevertheless if a child has got chronic constipation and he's bunged up then what happens is that because there is no space for that stool to go out so the uh the the sort of uh, further poo that is coming from from the top it just like you know seeps around it and goes out in the form of diarrhea so we call it as overflow diarrhea but the primary cause is constipation so these kids have uh, to be given some uh, medication that uh, gets some relief of the constipation and that would relieve the diarrhea as well so this is basically an overflow diarrhea caused by constipation celiac disease is another uh, uh, cause of uh, chronic diarrhea in the school age group now uh, this is basically gluten uh, sensitive enteropathy in which the uh, intestinal epithelium it gets destroyed because it's antigen antibody reaction against the gliadin component of the wheat so uh, that is uh, called as gluten sensitive enteropathy uh, also known, called as celiac disease and that is one of the common causes of uh, chronic diarrhea in the school age group then cystic fibrosis can also persist obviously because they've got chronic diarrhea and it's a lifelong condition so these kids can have diarrhea in the infancy they would be having chronic diarrhea in the uh, school age group as well inflammatory bowel disease uh, can happen though it's quite rare before eight to nine years of age and uh, obviously there are other symptoms as well these children have probably they pass like bloody stools and chronic diarrhea they might have weight loss they might have extra intestinal manifestations like mouth sores joint pains fever so on and so forth and sometimes the clostridium difficile diarrhea which is caused by prolonged antibiotic use uh, that can also cause chronic diarrhea and adolescents and again we have got the inflammatory bowel disease which is more common so this would be either chronic diarrhea with or without blood and they can have low grade fever weight loss extra intestinal manifestation the form of uh, joint pains uh, mouth sores so on and so forth sometimes no reason is found for their diarrhea which can sometimes alternate with constipation and we call it as irritable bowel syndrome though it's a diagnosis of exclusion similarly celiac disease can also persist in adolescent age group and it can cross chronic diarrhea especially if they are not on gluten uh, controlled diet uh some of the drugs can also cause diarrhea so it's very important to take a drug history as well if to, to to exclude the whether any drugs is causing diarrhea and if you are practicing in the tropical area then you should also keep it in mind that some tropical diseases like mbbs grdss that can cause chronic diarrhea in the tropical country especially where the environmental sa uh, sanitation is quite poor and those kids who are immunocompromised especially those who are hiv positive they can have fungal diarrhea as well so prolonged diarrhea because of opportunistic infections mostly caused by fungal uh, pathogens and um, you should keep that in your mind as well moving on to what is the clinical approach now the important thing is to take a thorough history and that thorough history should because it's a chronic problem you should always ask about the onset the circumstances in which it all started whether it started like gradually or whether it started off an acute episode of diarrhea you ask about the frequency of the stool how many loose stools the child passes per day how it has been progressing in the last like two weeks or if the history is beyond that how things have been progressing whether there are any associated features like weight loss like joint pains mouth ulcers feet Fever, so on and so forth you also ask about travel history if they have been traveling to um, areas where their tropical diseases are endemic you also ask them about the recent drug use especially antibiotics etc after that you will move on to the general examination and in general examination in chronic diarrhea it's very important that you focus on anthropometric indices so you would take uh, height for uh, weight height for age weight for age 
Again, you plot them on the appropriate growth charts. You look for any evidence of clubbing because clubbing usually, if there is clubbing associated with chronic diarrhea, it would either mean cystic fibrosis or inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, you look for short stature, which simply means that the uh, it's associated with malabsorption and probably with the loss of uh, important macro and micronutrient, which is causing st short stature. You also then uh, do a thorough uh, systemic examination and your focus should be on the gastrointestinal system and sometimes on the endocrine system as well, especially the thyroid and other things because, you know, some of the endocrinopathies can also cause chronic diarrhea. Now, as far as the best initial test is considered, like what, once you have taken a history, once you have done a thorough examination, now how to move forward? Now, the best initial test, you have to take a start from somewhere. That is stool microscopy. The tool's microscopy is the best initial test. You take a stool of the sam uh, stool, uh, a, st uh, a sample of the stool, and you send it to the lab so that they examine it under the microscope. And that can give valuable information whether there are any white blood cells, whether there are any red blood cells, whether there are any undigested particles, whether there are any ova or parasites within the stool sample. If there is a history of blood in the chronic diarrhea, whether it's consistent or whether it's persistent or whether it's on and off, it's very important that you request two things along with stool microscopy. Number one is fecal calprotectin because fecal calprotectin is a very sensitive uh, indicator of inflammatory bowel disease. So if that is high, it simply means you are dealing with some form of inflammatory bowel disease. And number two is fecal culture and sensitivity because sometimes Clostridium difficile, if it is an invasive Clostridium difficile, like, you know, for pseudomembranous colitis, so obviously that would help. Or if there is any other sort of a pathogen, which is uh, invasive and causing um, blood to come up in these loose stools, that would also be picked up. So remember, fecal calprotect in number two, stool, culture and sensitivity. If the stools are greasy and foul smelling, like they are very sticky, as the parents reported, or even if you see it, then it's important that you also request for fecal elastase because fecal elastase, again, is a sensitive indicator of pancreatic insufficiency, which can happen in isolated pancreatic disease or in cystic fibrosis. Then after you have done the stage one test, if you get an answer, well and good. If you don't get an answer, you can still do stage two tests, which include fluid blood count, iron studies, and um, a smear, a blood smear to exclude iron deficiency anemia. And you also look at bone profile to uh, find if there are any associated rickettic uh, changes. Stage three workup then consists of some of the invasive investigations, like for example, you can do the lower uh, GI endoscopy, which is also known as uh, sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy, or you can do an upper GI endoscopy as well if you are suspecting celiac disease along with the celiac screen. So these stage one, stage two, and stage three investigations would give you answers in most of the cases and you will get a diagnosis. Now coming down to the treatment. Treatment of chronic diarrhea is very simple. You have to treat the underlying cause. Obviously, this chronic diarrhea is being caused by something. So if this, let's say this chronic diarrhea is an overflow diarrhea being caused by constipation and you find it out, so you have to, you know, treat the constipation. So you will be giving macrogol uh, or stimulants so that the child gets rid of the constipation and the diarrhea would be resolved. Similarly, if you are dealing with celiac disease, you have to put the child on gluten free diet. If you are dealing with cow milk protein allergy, obviously you have to eliminate the milk and you have to put them on some hypoallergenic formula. If you are dealing with inflammatory bowel disease, then you have to give steroids or if they are already on steroids and not responding to it, then you will go on to like uh, what we call as second line treatment, which is immunosuppressants. Similarly, if it is irritable bowel syndrome, they mostly require reassurance and some lifestyle modifications. You also treat any associated features. So if they've got iron deficiency anemia, you will treat them for anemia. If they've got pancreatic insufficiency, you will treat them with pancreatic enzymes like Creon. Uh, you would be treating them if they've got vitamin D deficiency, you will give them vitamin D3. If they are suffering from iodine deficiency, you'll give them iodine as well. So obviously, associated deficiency have to be treated macro or micronutrient wise. And obviously, they require follow up to see how they are progressing. Uh, if they've got like associated weight loss, whether they catch up with that or not, whether their uh, diarrhea is resolved, whether the associated features get resolved or not. So important, appropriate follow up is also very important. So this was a short lecture about chronic diarrhea. So we focused on the cause of diarrhea. Uh, we focused on the approach to a child who's got chronic diarrhea and uh, what investigations we do and how do we 
treat them. So I hope you have liked this video and um, uh, if you are new to my channel and uh, you haven't subscribed yet then please do subscribe and if you have liked this video then obviously uh, give me a thumbs up and uh, also press the bell notification icon so whenever I upload a new video you always get an instant notification. So thank you very much for listening. Have a good day. Bye-bye.